Ladies and gentlemen, I have a world-class expert historian joining us today. You're not going to want to miss this episode, taking a deep dive into the Quran. And are there things within the Quran that help us understand history? James Howard Johnson joining us. And he actually, in our last episode, for those who are interested in checking that out, I believe I put it in the description. In our last episode, he left us on a cliffhanger. So I think it's best that we start where we left off and begin on the Quran. Here we go. Uh, religion, which before 628 was confined to a small group of emigrants in Medina, conquered the world. So I think so, the, yeah. secret, the secret is in the Quran. <laughs> and finally, it's been staring us in the face for all these years. Um, but uh, no one has noticed. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, and today, Dr. James Howard Johnston is joining us again. How are you, my friend? I'm very well. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the emotionally driven introduction there. <laughs> I, I, I really did. No, it was very, very good. Well, thank you so much. You know, if you may, for our audience, because our first episode we did, we did a long introduction. Can you recap what, what your expertise is, what, um, what education you have as we're bringing into this discussion on the Quran? Well, this, I think, will, uh, may well take away from uh, the authority of what, of what I, I will say. Um, I, uh, at university, which was Oxford, I studied classics as an undergraduate. Uh, then I did research in uh, Byzantine history and uh, spent most of my career uh, teaching undergraduates and uh, graduates Byzantine history at Oxford. But Byzantium, which is the East Roman Empire after it's lost its uh, richest provinces uh, to the Arabs, Byzantium, of course, neighbored uh, uh, the Arab Muslim world. And in order to uh, look at Byzantine history properly, to understand it, one has to understand it in context. And that's a context dominated by Islam. Well, then, um, after about 10 years, I found myself teaching an option uh, which was entitled uh, The Near East in the Age of Justinian and Muhammad. And then after a while, I started getting uh, digging deeper into early Islamic history. Now, so so what I need to say uh, to all those uh, watching or, or listening is that I am not a Quranic scholar. There were hundreds of Quranic scholars in the Islamic world through the Middle Ages, and there are many, many Islamic scholars uh, now. I'm not an Islamic scholar. I'm not a, a Quranic scholar. I'm not uh, an Islamic historian. I'm a historian interested in the Middle East and the wider world in late antiquity and the Middle Ages. And I have tried my best to acquire, at any rate, a smattering of Arabic. It's a bit more than a smattering. I have re read in company quite a lot of, Arab, of Arabic material. But I have to say that uh, the Quranic Arabic is very difficult. And I have just sort of pieced my way through some of the key passages to which I will uh, refer. But the idea uh, that I, I will be developing is an idea that grew out of uh, reading Arab texts in a translation, which um, so that uh, all your listeners, can check it for themselves. 
This I appreciate much. If I may paint a little picture as you're approaching this issue. We have a few camps of scholarship that are out there in the world. You have those who are traditionalist and revisionist. And typically what I find happening as I recently did a live stream, uh, reading the introduction to um, a friend of ours, Stephen J. Shoemaker, who um, pretty much goes into this debate that was brought up by Patricia Crone and Michael Cook. And the argument goes, here are non-Muslim sources that are earlier then our Muslim sources on the biography of Muhammad, was he alive during the conquest of Palestine? Was he dead, right? These are questions. And these are important questions that I think are, uh, the voices should be at least listened to and considered. And what I typically find happen is, no, 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 non-Muslim sources just have no um, awareness of the world in Arabia and what's going on. And then typically we have, well, no, these Muslim sources have an agenda, a theological agenda. They have a, a later cultural or even um, empire, if you could use the term, agenda as to why they might paint a certain picture of their prophet and stuff. So you have these issues that are really there and that are actual academic questions that are being discussed. And I paint that picture to put it onto Christianity for one second to say we should, if we're doing it with Christianity, we should be able to do this with any other world religion. I understand there are stereotypes due to issues that have happened in America even since 9-11. So we have to be very cautious in how we approach this. And the reason why is it because we're afraid or anything like that. It's, it's because we respect human beings and we do want to discuss these matters. One of the issues in Christianity is that Christians typically go – we have Christianizing language, and we need to study Christianity only through Mother Judaism. That has been thrown out of the window by, by actual academics and critical thinkers, critical scholarship. They go, no, 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 no. We need to think Mediterranean world. I'm sorry. You're missing the boat if you think Judaism only. Christianity is this brew, a stew of ideas that are all over the Hellenistic world coming into one. And I wonder— leaving the question, leading into the Quran, leading into Islam, if we could say the same about Seth, seventh century world and Islam. So I, I don't know. I'm throwing that at you just to give you my personal. Uh, well, I think your, your phrase about a brew or a stew, uh, ideas uh, in the air, sort of floating around like dust in sunlight. I think that's, that's a very, very good image. And I would certainly apply it to the Arabian Peninsula in the seventh century. But I want to backtrack a moment uh, on, the, uh, on the question of revisionists and traditionalists. I, I'm a traditionalist, but I'm a traditionalist on scholarly grounds. Um, I, I wrote a book um, 10, 12 years ago uh, on the sources for seventh century uh, history. And I went through uh, first the Greek uh, well, uh, the earliest are Greek uh, and Armenian, also Syriac, uh, uh, to piece together what they say about uh, the period before, during, and after the lifetime of the prophet. And then I used the conclusions that I got from those sources to try to check the value of the Sira, that is the biography of the prophet, which as you already indicated, was written uh, uh, long after long after the events. I mean, the original text is written mid eighth century, but what survives is a revision from I think the very end of the eighth century. Ibn Sam's uh, a revision of Ibn Ishaq. Now, uh, three. There are three. Uh, um, when it comes to to, to uh, the sixth uh, century. Uh, there are three episodes uh, which are dealt with in the Sira and where which we can check against uh, the external evidence. And the Sira stands up well. Uh, the first is uh, uh, the uh, um, a, a persecution of of Christians in Najran, uh, uh, um, uh, north of, in, in northern Yemen. Uh, which is covered by it was it was a sort of famous episode which uh, of which the news spread throughout the East Mediterranean world. Uh, second, uh, the uh, looming large in this era is the year of the elephant, five fifty two 
according to our external sources, when forces from the south, from uh, Himyar, uh, advanced on Mecca, but uh, did not conquer Mecca. And that, again, we've got external corroboration from Yemeni inscriptions, contemporary inscriptions. And then third, uh, there was the Persian uh, takeover, a uh, conquest of Yemen uh, in uh, 570 or 571, which is described in Greek sources. And we get we have a, an account in the Syria. So my conclusion about the Syria is this. Uh, one, that I mean, all historical sources, all historians, when they were right, when they are writing, are undoubtedly influenced by, you know, contemporary concerns. But their job is to try to uh, pull themselves away from it. Mm. And I see no particular reason to, uh, to see, uh, to, to view uh, the historians writing about the origins of Islam in the late 8th, 9th and 10th centuries, that they were so completely overcome by the present and present concerns that they paid no attention to the past. And for one all important reason, uh, the, the Prophet, Muhammad, the Quran, uh, uh, the, 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 um, uh, it's hard to conceive that people would really tamper fundamentally with the extraordinary story of the prophet of the prophet's life, uh, given that he was their prophet, that uh, their faith was based upon the words which he uttered, uh, uh, and uh, which they viewed as coming from God, the lone supreme, uh, or inspiring God. Quick so, question on that, if I may, just just uh, as this conversation leads us into what the the Quran tells you that you think many people just missed is when I look at Christianity, I think we can, using a historical methodology, we could piece maybe memory or find a reflection of Jesus as mm -hmm. an apocalyptic Jewish teacher who thought the end was near um, and may have said some philosophical things that you could find, particles, dust floating in the sunlight, as we talked about, mm -hmm. in the Mediterranean world, philosophies that are from Greek world, maybe even uh, sayings we find in Hillel and other rabbis and stuff. But we, I do think there is a major embellishment taking place on who he is in the Gospels themselves and how he's painted by Christians themselves, and they go on to do other Gospels. I only said that in the beginning of this to kind of say, could this not have been what happened to Muhammad as well in some respect? That doesn't mean there isn't historical kernel to some degree, but I wonder if using the same methodology, if we could walk away and say, maybe, maybe they remember their prophet through scripture to some degree. Um, mm -hmm. Sean Anthony wrote on the historical Muhammad, was he a shepherd or was he a merchant? And like, there's this question and debate. We know prophets were shepherds in the Bible. And you wonder if they want him to be less of a, uh, uh, less of a merchant and more of a prophet or a shepherd figure look. So I, I just, I'm, I'm saying that this is a question I have. And should we just hook, line and sinker, listen to the sources that Muslims say on their account of the prophet, or should we at least approach them skeptically like we would Christians? You see what I'm getting at? Yeah, yeah I, I understand. And you're quite right. Obviously, we have to handle the source with care. Obviously, with the passage of time, uh, stories have got embellished. embellished. Uh, and um, so, uh, and, and there's a lot of anecdote in the Sira. You see, the Sira. I mean, the gospel, the, the synoptic gospels, I imagine, run to about 25 pages, if you, 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 you right. print it tightly. Uh, the Sira runs for 750. So there's an awful lot of detail in there. And yet yeah, a lot of that can't be checked. And a lot of it has been tr uh, transmitted uh, uh, orally. Uh, but there's, there, there are uh, two crucial points to make. One, uh, if we believe the Sira about Mecca as being a, a, basically a city-state, a mercantile city-state, um, yeah, undoubtedly it was a literate city-state. So there were people who could write. So the notion that the Quran was written down uh, after the prophet had, had spoken, uh, to me there is nothing unexpected about that. So th I suspect there will have been some written a transmission of uh, traditions about the Muhammad, about Muhammad, as well as the Quranic, the Quran, the Quranic uh, surahs. Uh, that's the uh, th that's 
uh, the, the, the first point. But the second point is, uh, I'm, uh, I mean, th there's a great deal of um, sort of subsidiary matter uh, presented in the life of, of the prophet, this, this Sira. What I'm interested in is the sequence of major events. So first, uh, you know, the first uh, point at which uh, revelations come to the prophet now, um, which we date roughly to 610. Then, then we have the general lines of uh, his increasingly difficult time at Mecca. Then in 622, and it's a date fixed by uh, the Hijra dating, which begins from that moment, you have the emigration to Medina. At Medina, uh, indeed from early in the Medina phase, we have a document which almost everyone accepts as an authentic document of the, t of the, of, of, of the time, the constitution of Medina, which is regulating the relations of the emigrants who've come with, with Muhammad to uh, 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 the relations between them and the Jews of Medina and the Arabs of Medina with uh, the prophet as the uh, leading uh, figure and arbitrator and the fundamental uh, 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 um, element of the agreement is that they will all band together to resist attack from without. Uh, so uh, then we have uh, uh, three battles, the Battle of Badr, a Muslim victory, uh, Uhud, a Meccan victory when they advanced on Med Med uh, Medina and won a victory. Uh, 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 Badr is dated to 624, Uhud to 625, and then in 627, the so-called Battle of the Ditch, which is when a large Meccan force, uh, accompanied by many, many allies, in effect blockaded Medina, demonstrated their power, but didn't press on into the oasis itself to crush uh, uh, the immigrants, their helpers, the Ansar, and um, what, if anything, remained of the Jewish tribes of Medina by that date. Uh, then we have the episode which particularly interests me, which is uh, dated um, on internal grounds to uh, 628, negotiations between uh, the Muslims and the Quraysh, that, that is the, uh, the Meccans, at Hudaybiyah. Then two years later, there is a so-called conquest of Mecca, when uh, the Medinans, uh, a Medinan force comes to Mecca and the Meccans submit, recognize Muhammad's authority and Muhammad cleanses the Kaaba of its idols. Then in 632, we have the death of the prophet and then we move into um, caliphal history where there's, there's external corroboration. I mean, I, I've done careful studies of the conquest of Palestine, Syria, uh, and Iraq, looking at the external evidence, uh, using the external evidence uh, to uh, um, provide the framework for the Islamic material. And it tallies well, especially for Iraq. And then I've done it for I Iran. And again, to my great surprise, it tallies. So I'm, I, I'm, I mean, I think all Islamists, going back to Patricia Croner, believe Yes, there are kernels of truth there. Mm -hmm. Everyone, everyone believes that. But I'm, sim I'm simply believing that there are, there are more of them, they're mm -hmm. more influential, and that more of the material uh, uh, relates to reality than to the subsequent literary um, concerns of the writers. I appreciate you painting that picture too, and I'm glad to hear your thinking as you took us on a historical picture of, of imagining a sequence of events to the death of the prophet. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we titled this show today, The Secret is in the Quran. And so dealing with this piece of literature, which it becomes the holy book, if you will, which is really mm -hmm. uh, what's unique and special about it is actually the recitation of these words, not so much just the text, even though many people do value the text itself. It's really the recitation of it. But Tell us, what is it that you have found that you believe um, is right under our noses in the Quran 
and people aren't really just it's right there. Like, well, why aren't we seeing it? And and so yeah. why don't people see it? And what is it? Well, I'm afraid I'm going to leave you in suspense along with your with your <laughs> listeners. Not not for another, well, not for another podcast, but just for a little while. Okay. Because the general point is that the single most important piece of evidence uh, for seventh century history is the text of the Quran, as we as it was uh, the, the sort of con the canonical uh, uh, collection of the component parts of the Quran, which are known as surahs, uh, almost certainly dates from uh, the, six, the 640s. And what, what it contains uh, are the uh, utterances of the prophet. So we really ought to attend to that first of all. And uh, if, if I have a criticism of professional Islamicists is that many do not. I mean, they look at the other material, but it's there. And the uh, 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 one of the secrets of Islam's success is to be found in the earlier surahs of the of the Quran, where uh, Muhammad, like Jesus, was an apocalyptic prophet. You're aware of the approaching end, but he produced a sort of cosmology very different from the Old Testament or New Testament cosmologies, because Muhammad's was a cos cosmology in which, yes, uh, like uh, the Christian and the Jewish, uh, God was supreme. But God's omnipotence, God's omnipotence is a sort of accentuated to such an extent. I mean, he's responsible for every little thing happening on earth. Uh, the, the the sprouting of a of a very very small plant in the desert, uh, all vegetal and all animal life, everything. Uh, so he is infinitely powerful. The second thing uh, ab about uh, uh, the um, Quranic God is that he is infinitely remote. He is an awesome. A human, he's not a divinity sort of modeled on humanity. He has nothing to do with that. Infinitely remote, awesome, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of presiding, presiding over everything. Um, the third key component of these earlier surahs in the Quran is that the, the individual uh, believer to whom uh, Muhammad's uh, words uh, were addressed was addressed as an individual responsible for every word, for every act, for every thought uh, in his life or her life. And those, and the final crucial element, which I think makes it uh, an extraordinarily powerful um, uh, mix, was that the end was near, he's an apocalyptic prophet, and in the near future, that awesome, a human, infinitely remote divinity would be coming uh, uh, face to face with the isolated uh, individual plucked out of his kin group, and that individual would be judged. Now, that is the central message of the Quran, and in the and in of the early surahs. And then as we, then subsequently, it's basically following through, illustrating God's power, arguing that there can be no other divinities because all power is God. Uh, defending, Muhammad defending himself when he's asked to perform miracles, saying, no, I am simply a mouthpiece of God. All power is God's. He performs the miracles. The jinn and the angels, they can simply talk. They can't, they have no power. All power is God's. So much of the Quran, this is argued for, uh, basically from the phenomena, from phenomena which are which were visible uh, to all Muhammad's listeners, namely the phenomena of the desert, where life was so uh, so frail, a vegetal and and animal uh, life, from strange rock formations in the desert, which were interpreted as the remnants of structures belonging to peoples who had been punished by God. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this, that opens a whole different can of worms of like how, um, 
locations get interpreted in and myths uh, develop around some of these stories like major civilizations in the ancient near east end up having to become nomadic due to probably um agricultural droughts and things like that and then centuries later they come back or people come back and they go giants built this place because there's no way we could have you know yeah. so it makes me think the similar thinking process is going yeah. on there I, I like what you said about the apocalyptic prophet thing because i am i am on board with this idea as well and thinking for sure uh that the apocalypticism is a drove a driving motivating factor for the initiation of a movement looking at the apostle paul i think the reason he wanted to go so far into rome and was driven so far is the end is near and he's got to try and mm -hmm. he even might think he is actually a, a co-creator in making the end happen so to speak if that makes sense yeah. so yeah. so um yeah I, I like this idea i know that there are people who go no that they want to get away from that because there might be implications due to apocalypticism and maybe muhammad thought in his lifetime or in the people that he's talking to his lifetime this would happen um Continue where where you're going with your train of thought because I'm loving this picture and we will get to Q and A at the end. I really appreciate all the super chats, the questions, the comments, and things like that. But uh, we have to take this journey today with yes. James. Well, well, the second the second stage of the journey is to is to that one needs to understand why the notion of such a god, so remote, uh, so all powerful so beyond any, basically any human comprehension, why that should prove attractive within Arabia. So yes, yes, we've got fears of the end, uh, perfectly natural given that there's a, there's a world war being waged in the North, which they're aware of, uh, but why, how could this really get a grip on Arab minds? And this is, uh, this is where it's pure hypothesis, but we do know that in uh, pre-Islamic times, uh, there were all sorts of gods um, uh, worshipped and uh, placated uh, uh, within within Arabia, and um, uh, but there was also a notion of fate far above, uh, you know, the everyday hurly burly of life. Fate just overarching overarching things. Now, my hypothesis is that uh, in a sense, uh, I mean, and, and this, this sounds very, very uh, irreligious, but in a sense, uh, uh, fate has been brought down and brought into focus. And Allah, the Allah conjured up in the Quran, the, uh, the, 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 or you might say fate was a precursor uh, and that fate is brought uh, into focus and fate is so not humanized because it's all powerful in control of everything but fate is then connected with what is happening on earth and in human life so that Allah in that sense Allah uh, fate fate has mutated uh, so, so you could say that there's been an awareness of the existence of Allah from the beginning of time in Arabia where life you know, life was lived against, uh, you know, against very, very difficult uh, uh, surroundings. So, of course, human life was viewed as uh, uh, something very small and very, very vulnerable. So there had to be a notion of something higher so that it's, it's already there. There's a pre-knowledge of Allah. And that's there in every Arab in Arabia at the time that Muhammad is preaching to the faithful. So that then the key task for Muhammad and the immigrants and their allies in Medina was to be able to communicate with the rest of Arabia. But the position from uh, 625 on was that they were uh, prevented from sending out missions, uh, sending out, they, they basically were, and sometimes under tight blockade, as in 627, but at other times under a loose blockade, which basically prevented such uh, missionary work. And it's then that we come to uh, what happened in 628. Okay, so th this is the fun part. Um, I want to say some 
first of all, very interesting way of painting the hypothesis there. I imagine if we take that fate notion and then specifically Muhammad being influenced some way due, due to the Judeo um, Christian uh, worldview. And, and let's be honest, there's archeological finds right here that are in Arabia, Christian churches, Jew, Jews and Christians are living here. So there's probably what we would say polytheism, just to be frank, or pagan beliefs in different gods, Christianity and Judaism, and maybe even the Christians get a bad rap uh, even among some of these people because they're debating on God died. In some regions, you know, especially I think in Constantinople, there's like all these issues of like God died on the cross. So there's deicide. This is something I heard from Peter von Sievers. So I don't know if you and him talk or if there's a, if you, mm -hmm. if you're aware of his work at all. Okay. He, he thinks that the Christology debates play into something we see in the Quran as well on this stance that God doesn't have any sons. Like it might play into your fate plus mm -hmm. the Christology debate that's going on that Christians are literally saying God died on the cross. Some of them. And some of them are saying, no, it wasn't God, you know, the hypostatic union. And it's like, the human side, but the deity was alive. And then you have all these weird things going mm -hmm. on and they still can't get their heads wrapped around it after seven centuries of this debate. Um, but then the Muslims come in or the Arabs say, Hey, enough is enough, you know, and they, they have a, I'm just going to interrupt you for, for please, one second. Please. To say that, uh, one of the steady themes in later on in the Quran is uh, that, uh, the Christians, it's disagreement among the Christians. It's a quarreling. It's a factionalism. Mm -hmm. So you're quite right. Oh, sorry. I, yeah. The, I mean, that's the thing that he thinks there's a polemic in the Quran, which would be early, right? This is an early witness. I am, by the way, one of those people who does think the Quran is literally holding the words that probably come from Muhammad. I don't know mm -hmm. if every single jot and tittle goes back. There's no way to prove before the canonization, I would say, of Uthman, but like the lower palimpsest manuscript, uh, sauna manuscript makes me think like, hold on, we had something and it looks very similar, even mm -hmm. if it's not in the same order perfectly and everything's mm -hmm. identical. It's close enough to make me go, I think they're preserving the words of a guy um, named Muhammad. So I'm with you and I wonder if there's a way to connect the fate concept in your hypothesis to the debate that's going on within Judeo-Christian Christologies and the world that is down there in Arabia and making what we see the foundations to what becomes another world religion, Islam. Um, I, I, I'm, I think I'm fundamentally at odds with uh, a, a sort of uh, an assumption that may be running through what you're uh, saying. Okay. Um, I, I, I agree that Christian and Jewish ideas were current. I agree, and we all must, that uh, Muhammad looked uh, back to the New Testament and the Old Testament and uh, uh, regarded his uh, uh, revelation as a third revelation, third, the third and revising uh, revelation. Uh, so, yes, there are obviously connections, but f but in uh, and obviously there are all sorts of of elements within Islam, which for which you can find precedents and parallels, and of course, Muhammad in his preaching uh, frequently has recourse to Old Testament figures. Above all, uh, a Abraham in, in the first instance. So he he retells Old, Test Old Testament stories. So that's absolutely undeniable. But uh, uh, my uh, essential point is that it's not the materials um, which are um, which, which, ma which matter, it's the arrangement in which they are put. And what we have within the Quran are two, uh, uh, um, two or three um, key elements which are fundamentally at odds with the assumptions, the thought worlds of um, uh, the Roman and Persian, Christian and Jewish worlds around. One is the remoteness of God mm -hmm. um, uh, and basically a lack of, a, a, a lack of, um, I mean, he doesn't need, inter he needs no intermediaries. Uh, now in the worlds around, there are all sorts of intermediaries. 
Um, and of course, there are hum human intermediaries or um, uh, who act as in intercessors. So uh, 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 a heaven sort of populated by intermediate figures has gone. It's become a void between God and man. And the, um, uh, th there's no dualist struggle going on on earth between uh, holy men and demons. Holy men, I mean, they can't be holy men. They have no power. Can't be demons. They have no power. So uh, the fundamental dualism, which l l links together the whole of the surrounding world. I mean, it's prominent within Iran. It's sort of um, subversive within uh, the, the, the Christian and, and Jewish world, but it's there. A it's absolutely missing. And, and finally, there is, and I'd say that it's because of fate, uh, the notion of fate uh, lies behind this, that th this is a world utterly different from the comfortable world of agriculture, towns and villages and great cities of the world around. It's a desert. So what we've got is a familiar mix, but a different shape, different light motifs. So uh, basically no dualist struggle on earth, no intermediaries and an all powerful divinity presiding over it so it's the same and it's also different yeah and, and i think that i think maybe i came out not quite making myself clear on that because what i was getting at is that the quran seems to be in opposition to these other models and and mm -hmm. in fact jesus didn't die on a cross mm -hmm. right like like they're they're literally opposing the the forms that are around i suspect and maybe it's the fate model um that is somehow influencing that perception of god number one because that is the primary it's like uh for jews you know there's only one god like they have their their mm -hmm. statement of faith um this this seems to be a strong essence and i do think there's influence from both but I think it's reactionary in a sense too, um, mm -hmm. in some in some respects. So I, I maybe we're maybe we're actually in line. It's the fate thing that I have never tried to factor into this mm. equation, if that makes sense. But you do think it is an op, like it's it's reacting uh, to some of these other. Um, uh, yes, but I, it, it's it's. Uh, but as far as I know, of course, I'm not a, a pre-Islamic historian of Arabia. Right. So I, t I, I pick it up from from others writing, but it's particularly the French, uh, the French scholar uh, Rodinson uh, made much made much of this. And, and his is a, a sort of human reading of the history of the time. But he's he's basically uh, accepting the main lines of the traditional narrative. But he stresses the importance of fate. Well put. Thank you. So something called 628 uh, mm -hmm. is on our horizon and we're ready to take the tour with you. Right. So the position is that uh, Islam, you could view Islam as something highly from the from, from, from the, the point of view of the Meccans. It's something highly infectious, highly contagious. Um. But for them, it's been contained. So it's like COVID-19, uh, had it been contained in Wuhan. Uh, right. uh, it's it's contag contagious. If it gets out, because it's it's speaking to uh, um, its fundamental element in the thought world of Arabia, it's going to spread fast. Uh, uh, you know, maybe not as a religion that takes, you know, that that takes over and controls all behavior, but the basic idea of it is going to be very, very attractive. So, uh, from 625, uh, uh, Muhammad and his followers have, in effect, been penned back uh, within Medina. Um, twice, the Meccans have shown their military political power uh, in 625 at Uhud and in 627 at the Battle of the Ditch. Um, their, their nexus of allies has held together despite the efforts of uh, uh, the Muslims to erode it. It's held together so that Islam basically is trapped, isolated, confined uh, to, uh, Me to Medina. So, and, uh, and, now, and, and, 
if I may, James, just to point out one comparison, I love what you said about it, it, it's infectious. And, and one of the things many of the scholars I talk to on Christianity say that made Christianity so um, contagious, if you will, is that it appealed to the poor mm. so much. And there were so many poor in Rome that mm. this was just ready to take up. And there were so many like people that had money who would get kind of like a thumbs up and get a lot of street cred, if you will, from helping taking care of the poor. So there, uh, who was it? Um, Nietzsche once talked about, it's a poor man's philosophy, a slave mentality type of philosophy. And it, and it really did well in mm -hmm. the Roman empire out the gate to the poor. So using that analogy to say in Arabia, using the fate model, combining it with apocalypticism, and you're already living in a tough world. This you is are. ready to go viral. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And, you, it's, and that understanding is absolutely vital for understanding the extraordinary, the extraordinary success achieved. But so now, now, now I'm going to quote a little bit of the Quran. Okay. And I'm going to quote it in, uh, not in uh, elegant, uh, modern, uh, very modern translations, but I'm. Um, many years ago, a Muslim pupil of mine uh, gave me the, the, the Holy Quran, that is, uh, uh, the authorized uh, Quran, so Arabic text and authorized English translation, which dates from the 1940s. And um, so it, it, it can be bettered, uh, but um, it's, the, it's the translation that uh, Muslims, uh, certainly Britain, accept. Now, I'm turning to Surah 2. Now, um, Surah 2 is in effect in, in the, uh, the, uh, the canonical arrangement of the Quran. It's, it's number one after, uh, Surah 1 is just as a little, in, a little introductory invocation. Surah 2 is the first one and it's much the longest. It's a Surah in which uh, the, uh, the sort of law code the, the, the essentials of the law code, uh, the Sharia, are, are laid down by the, the, uh, the Prophet. Um, now, it, it opens with a long denunciation of Jews and Christians. So the sorts of arguments about Christians that you, you've been touching on right. uh, a feature here. Now, it's a central section, verses 125 to 167, which are the crucial verses. Uh, um, these, this central section deals with the Kaaba, that is the great cube at Mecca, which at the time was the, pre the premier pagan cult center in Arabia. And it attributes its original construction to Abraham. Now, Abraham has been mentioned many, 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 many times before in the Quran, but never uh, until this very late surah. As you say, it's, it's one of the absolute latest surahs, uh, and that's generally agreed. Uh, 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 never until this and a couple of other very late surahs, never ever mentioned in, the, in uh, connection with the Kaaba. Now, the surah then goes on uh, to talk about uh, the direction of prayer, the Qibla. The Qibla has been changed. It's an arresting passage. The only reference to dissent among Muhammad's listeners in the Quran, and I quote, the fools among the people will say, what hath turned them from the Qibla to which they were used? Say, to God belong both east and west. He guideth whom he will to a way that is straight. That's verse 142. And it's a perfectly reasonable explanation. You don't actually need any direction of prayer. God is everywhere. You just need the direction of prayer for the orderly, you know, or orderly worship. A second response is given in the following verse. And we appointed, I quote, and we appointed the Qibla to which thou wast used, 
only to test those who followed the apostle from those who would turn on their heels. Indeed, it is momentous, except to those guided by God. Now shall we turn thee to a kibla that shall please thee. Turn then thy face in the direction of the sacred mosque, Al-Masjid. Wherever ye are, turn your faces in that direction. Now, um, you note, the surah is very late. Uh, the faithful are being instructed to turn from the Qibla to which they were used, which almost certainly, well, it's generally agreed, was Jerusalem, the holy city of Jews and Christians. Uh, so they've had a Qibla pointing there probably from before the Hijra, the emigration to Medina, and for several subsequent years. So we we can't date the Sura uh, precisely, but as I say, it's the longest and it's one of the last, if not the last. So, reference, and it's perfectly plain that it causes a stir among the faithful, as of course it would. Um, and of course, there were consequences because if they were to pray towards the Kaaba, were they also going to be required to go on pilgrimages to the Kaaba, like the pagans? Were they also going to be required to make sacrifices like the pagans? Well, in other surahs of the Quran, again, very late, uh, that is said. Um, again, I'll just quote from Surah 22. Abraham has been told to sanctify God's house, I quote, for those who compass it round or stand up or bow or prostrate themselves. End of quote. He's also been told to proclaim the pilgrimage for men uh, to come on foot on lean mounts and to, I quote, celebrate the name of God through the days appointed over the cattle which he has provided for them, then eat ye thereof and feed the distressed ones in want. Then let them complete the rites prescribed for them, perform their vows and circumambulate the ancient house, that is the Kaaba. They are to shun the abomination of idols, shun the word that is false. The sacrificial cam camels we have made for you as among the symbols from God, in them is good for you. Then pronounce the name of God over them as they line up. When they are down on their sides, eat ye thereof and feed such as live in contentment and such as beg with due humility. Thus have we made animals subject to you that ye may be grateful. It is not their meat nor their blood that reaches God. It is your piety that reaches him. So what... Uh, uh, Muhammad was um, instructing the faithful to do was to carry out the full set of pagan rituals. Now, I think that the evidence of the Quran, a seventh century text containing the utterances of the prophet is the best sort of evidence we can have for uh, the incorporation within the new apocalyptic, mon highly monotheist religion of the whole apparatus of pagan worship uh, centered in Mecca. Now, why? Why? Because the Ummah was isolated, unable to communicate with the wider world, an accommodation had to be reached with Mecca. Uh, the surah about the changing of the Qibla, that is, the ch and the changing of the Qibla itself, preceded the negotiations at Hudaybiyah in late 628. 
That was the huge concession made by Muhammad and the Muslims to the Meccans. It was a concession which ensured that for uh, evermore, Mecca would be uh, as important, if not more important than Medina in the development of the new faith. And thus uh, the Quraysh elite of Mecca ensured their place in the new world order, which Islam would bring about. Now it would bring it about because the Meccan, the crucial Meccan con uh, uh, concessions were two, one, an armistice to last for 10 years, two, freedom to communicate with the tribes of Arabia. And within three years, uh, within two years, the whole balance of power had shifted as it was the Medinans who had, who could advance on Mecca with a large body of allies. Now, the consequence of that was that the new faith, which you've rightly described as, you know, it's, it's immensely, it's a powerful, it's a it's immensely powerful explosive mix of, es of, es of eschatology and uh, um, uh, austere uh, monotheism uh, appealing to Arabs. This was being married to uh, a city-state with ramified connections with the outside world, uh, a mistress of statecraft, uh, good, uh, good, good organizer, um, and the uh, which and its its Meccan expertise, I think, which can alone um, which, which is required to explain uh, the victories in conventional engagements. Of the, of the Muslim Arabs over both uh, Roman and Persian armies in the field. Without the, the combination of these two very different components, I don't think that um, uh, the conquests could have occurred. Hmm. Without the agreement, I don't think Islam would really have percolated out through the Arabian Peninsula. Um, so that's that's the um, uh, that is the uh, the uh, um, the secret uh, which I've been uh, uh, which I alluded to. Uh, what I need to say, though, I mean, but look, I'm, I'm just let you get in. You're fine. <laughs> you want to get in? Um, in the Sira, that is the biography of the Muhammad. The change in the Qibla is recorded in a single, simple sentence immediately after the Hijra. Um, so yes, there was a change of Qibla, but it's been misplaced. It's been placed six years too early. Uh, and it's, it's unadorned. There's no elaboration at all. It's simply put in there. And that, th 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 that is contradicted uh, by the, the, uh, the sur surahs 22 to... And I think the other late one, which is going on about uh, is Sura, yes, is Sura 5, um, uh, which are all late. And those are the ones that talk about the Kaaba, the, the, the new Qibla, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the pilgrimage and sacrifices and connect Abraham with the Kaaba. Now, obviously, the connection of Abraham with the Kaaba provides a justification after the event for the change of Qibla. Now, in the Sira, uh, when we come to 628, I've already referred to it, there were negotiations taking place at Hudaybiyah on the very edge of the sacred area within Mecca. Now, we have an account of those uh, 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 negotiations and they begin because Mohammed is trying to go on the little pilgrimage. So he's acting on what has already been uh, 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 um, announced. And he stopped. And then negotiations occur. And then in our account of the, um, uh, the negotiations, we seem to hear that all the concessions are being made by the Meccans, namely the armistice, the freedom to communicate, and uh, Meccans who want to convert to uh, Islam are allowed to move. 
um, uh, to Medina, and uh, ditto Medinans who might want to go, go back to, uh, to Mecca. So all the concessions, uh, uh, if you don't view the going on the pilgrimage as a huge concession made on the other side, are going from the Meccans to the Muslims. But then, and this is one of the reasons why I put considerable faith in this era, there was an argument about the wording of the treaty document. And the Muslims naturally wanted to refer to Muslim, uh, to, to, to Muhammad, as the messenger of God. But no, said the Meccans, no. You will me you refer to Muhammad as a member of his family, his clan and his tribe. And the Muslims gave way. Well, then there was a the question of how to refer to Allah. Now, yes, Allah was one of the three senior gods accepted uh, by, uh, 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 worshipped in Mecca. Uh, he's not Allah, you know, the Allah semi-fate, uh, the real Allah. Right. Uh, but he's, he's, one, he's one of three gods. And so the, the Muslims uh, want, uh, want the reference to be a plain reference to their Allah, the all-powerful, the compassionate. No, say the Muslims, uh, we refer to Allah, you know, one of our gods. Oh, you again, mean not the Muslims, but the... Uh, the uh, sorry, the, 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 the Meccans insist, Meccans. They insist that uh, Allah be referred to as uh, you know, a Meccan god, uh, one, of, one of the three leading gods. And again, that was accepted by the Muslims. So that tells one, well, one, it tells one that the Sira is surprisingly good source. Uh, two, it tells one that the Muslims were in a very, very, very weak position at the time. Right. And a concession must have been made. Now, that was something that I'd realized long before I'd closely studied the latest surahs of the Quran, which are very long and uh, have none of the sort of grip on the, the alien reader that the early apocalyptic surahs have. And then I saw... Uh, the clear evidence that the um, the turning to Mecca and to the Kaaba and the acceptance of pagan sacrifice, pagan pilgrimage, uh, uh, yes, with the Kaaba cleansed of idol, Kaaba and the area around it cleansed of the idols of uh, the old gods, but that the, uh, the essential uh, elements of cult associated with the Kaaba in Mecca were incorporated into the new religion. And that, I think, creates the, uh, the, sort, of, the sort of nuclear uh, uh, capability of the um, explosion that would occur. Wow, there's so much here um, using criteria of embarrassment here in a way, um, especially if we're looking at where Islam took itself, you would see this these surahs and be like, that seems to be pretty, like, if we're going to be give it a fair shake, that sounds really out the gate, something that would be the case. And I know that this was not the topic of today's discussion, but as someone, and by the way, our audience needs to know, you're not like a Islamic scholar, so to speak, mm -hmm. but you are well read on this material and you know history. Um, you know, I look at the satanic verses, right? This brings into a whole nother debate discussion. Like, is there valid reasons to think that this was something early on and there's a conceding taking place as we see with these early surahs? There's a concession and they're kind of going, okay, okay, we'll refer to him by his tribe, his name. And uh, okay, 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 one among the three, but we're going to recognize this as the one yep. supreme, but you will you know, recognize it the way you recognize it. I is there a reason to think in your estimation that the satanic verses might be an early memory? Uh, I've not, that's not anything that I, I haven't studied. You know, I simply read, I've read the literature on, right. on the subject. Um, uh, all I think I would say is that uh, one can see within the Quran when the surahs are rearranged into approximate chronological order, one can see all sorts of developments occurring, and um, uh, which 
seem to you know respond to uh, our reactions to to circumstance now that doesn't mean that the utterances of the prophet don't come uh, from god but what it does mean is that god is alert to the problems of uh, the ummah in the real in the real world and the most extraordinary change which he ordered was a change ordered in uh uh in Surah, in Surah 2, at some point in 628, mm -hmm. before those negotiations at Hudaybiyah. Um, of course, another view would be to say that uh, Muhammad was inspired by God, that uh, much of what he said uh, was divinely inspired, but he's also operating in the real world and trying to, and trying to, uh, you know, maneuvering to try to keep uh, the new faith, the true faith, uh, the faith which is uh, meant for all of humanity, uh, to keep its uh, to keep it alive and enable it. I, I could imagine this, especially as we see with this concession that you're describing here of the uh, going from you know Jerusalem to the Kaaba and finding a way to reconcile. If this is a memory early on, I could see that being um, taken over to the satanic verses, but that wasn't something we were expecting to get into today. Mm -hmm. I was just asking uh, the last question I have. And then um, if you have anything you want to wrap up a ribbon on in this, in this topic, we'll take mm -hmm. Q and a and allow our audience to ask questions via super chat. So they're helping support the channel. And I brought this up as a little snippet in our last episode. And you were like, I'll have to do some read up. But maybe if you haven't done any reading on this specific thing, you could tell me what you think right now or what you if you could remember. You've forgotten more than I'll ever know, probably in history. So mm -hmm. um, you're, you're a historian. Yeah, I love your work. The Gog and Magog, the, the, there's this wall and apocalypticism is something that gets attached to this wall. So when we look at the constantinople we look at heraclius we look at the persian empire we see christians on both sides we see jews on both sides there is this idea that like the end in this wall plays a role gog and magog is going to play a significant role and then where do we find it in the quran so can you give us anything that you know about the significance of this gog magog and this location and how this plays a role in the powers that be and the end of time. Is there anything that you could sh shed light on that? That's, you're, you're, you're already stretching me. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I think, I mean, the, the obvious thing that one can say, I mean, I'm uh, the origins of Gog and Magog, uh, I suppose they're old, it's it's in the old it's in the old testament i know that it's then it's very important in the legend of alexander um uh, the, i mean the essential point is that uh, it seems to be a um a sort of scenario in which the civilized world jewish christian other mm -hmm. uh in a, a, a temperate zone is aware of potential threats of, of from the north, from the north, and of course there were potential threats from the north. There were Huns, uh, there were Khazars, there were Pechenegs, there were Kumans, there were Mongols, uh, and there were in this in the early seventh century Turks who did indeed break through uh, the the Persian walled defences between the Caspian and the Caucasus mountains. Uh, but of course, it's a scenario which it views the trouble as likely to come from the north, whereas the whirlwind came from the south, from the uh, the, the Arab Muslims. Um, and um, so, I, I, the, 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 I think there's, I, I think it is. It's an Old Testament notion uh, there. So, uh, we, you should one would view the uh, the um the Jews as sort of part of a Middle Eastern world which is conscious of the, the existence of a much wider and threatening world uh, to the north but but there's one final thing I did want to say which yeah. is which is this that uh, the Hajj 
pilgrimage and all its associated rites um, is so embedded a part of Islam that it's virtually, well, it's impossible, or virtually impossible for uh, anyone to um, uh, envisage an Islam without the Hajj. And what I'm, what I'm doing is simply saying that on an analogy with early Christians in Rome, uh, who, uh, when asked uh, to perform the, the, normal the normal sacrifices, refused and were martyred, uh, this accommodation is quite extraordinary. And we think of it as an integral part of Islam, but just standing back, one can see that it's got nothing to do with the fundamental tenets mm. of the new faith. It's got, uh, I mean, subsequently it served a very, very useful purpose because, of course, Islam spread over so much of the world and you had jihad uh, uh, in its uh, sort of martial interpretation, drawing people to the frontier regions and you've got the Hajj as a sort of dynamic force pulling people back to the center so that it, uh, it, 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 it acts as a very, very important a bonding agent mm. within Islam at large. So it certainly performs a function. But I don't think the prophet um, could envisage that far into the future. Wow. This has been a blast. I hope everybody watching has learned a lot. Uh, your, hist your history uh, is wonderful. I love learning a lot of these things in the different kingdoms and empires. And if, if people don't know who you are, they really should uh, search some of your work. You have a lot of works on Amazon as well. I have them in the description in the Amazon recommended reading list. So you can go and read many of his books. Um, we're going to go to Q&A now, if that's okay with you, James. And yes, James told me I can call him by his first name, just so everybody knows I'm not being disrespectful. Um, I, I try to keep it simple because half the time I can't pronounce names anyway, and uh, it saves me from embarrassment. Well, I've got an American name, you see, so how Johnson wouldn't be a problem for <laughs> because I am indeed American, quarter American from my father's father. Well, see, I, I knew it. I could tell that you were. You know, I could just <laughs> sense it. No. Uh, seriously, appreciate it, Billy, for becoming a member. I don't know if you're watching right now, but thank you so much for becoming a member of our channel. Constellation Pegasus. If you can't answer any of these questions, James, don't feel uh, bad. What's going on with Allah using stars to pelt eavesdroppings jinn? Seems the Quran really says this. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's sort of annoying jinn who are chattering too much. Uh, well, it's a sort. I mean, I think he's he's not. Uh, it can't be meant literally. Um, um, uh, but, but look, I I don't I I don't know. I refer you to Quranic commentators. It's not one of the light motifs right. that. Uh, um, uh, um, yeah, I think the Quran does say it. It says lots of, I mean, th there are all sorts of inconsistencies in the Quran. Um, um, but no, I'm basically, I'm stumped. I can't explain it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Doc Plorumana says, how much historical information can be garnered from the Chronicles of Sebios? Seems in the Byzantine writers we have little of any value. Now, um, the Chronicle of Sebios, in fact, I, I worked on a translation and commentary with a, 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 a professor of Armenian, a colleague. So that's a work I know very well. And it's one of the works that Patricia Croner uh, picked up uh, uh, to, uh, to, to use. Um, so the answer is that uh, it, it's basically written... It's written in the 650s and it's got a postscript dated from 661. And it gives an account of the prophet, uh, the centrality of Palestine, uh, and some key, uh, key rules of, uh, um, of Muslims, I mean, like not drinking. Uh, the prophet having been a merchant, which which tally with with what we can extract from the bi biography. 
Now, as regards Byzantine writers, that is writing in Greek, uh, there are little snippets of information, but most of uh, most of them date from uh, well, they, they cover the conquests, but they don't they don't have anything to say about the life of the prophet, with one exception. A text which is called the Doctrina Jacobi Nuper Baptizati, which is a proselytizing uh, 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 work, um, ostensibly written by a, a converted a, a Jew who's converted Christianity called Jacob, who's trying to win over the other Jews in North in North Africa. And within that text, which dates from the mid seventh century, there is a brief description of. Um, Armed action in the Middle East, conquests, and a prophet, a prophet who is uh, um, basically uh, gaining ground by the sword. Um, but so the, the the answer is that uh, contemporary uh, Greek sources only come into play once the Muslims are entering Palestine. And even so, it's the Syrian sources that are better. Wow. Thank you so much for that answer. Stop scamming, man. I've heard it said that in the 7th century, Mecca wasn't a particularly large city at the time. What were the largest cities in Arabia at the time? Well, they, uh, it, uh, I would guess that there were, uh, that Najran in the northern, uh, north of the Yemen and um, other towns in Yemen and on the south coast were substantial. But as for Mecca, um, uh, yes, some people view it as just a sort of gathering of <laughs> shepherds' huts. But no, the Sira, uh, the importance of uh, do what I was saying about uh, external checks on the Syria, the three external checks for the sixth century uh, uh, Syria that uh, I, I, I've, I've mentioned, is that the Syria presents Mecca as a major city state, a major uh, trading city, political center of Arabia, which has drawn in a whole swathe of, of, of Bedouin tribes around into a, a system of, 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 alliance, of alliances, which both secure its trade routes uh, uh, to the north and give it a sort of immense political authority. So I I would say that Mecca was the largest city uh, at the time, but it would, in the post-conquest period, be overtaken very soon by Medina, where the, um, the enriched elite of the new Muslim order uh, resided. And it's to Medina, it's for, it was for Medina, I think, that the the surplus grain of Egypt was being shipped out. It used to go to Constantinople. It was shipped out across the Red Sea uh, as early as 644. And in Medina, there is these grand households and uh, there are poets commissioned by uh, different uh, great men writing poetry. I, I long for there to be uh, a, a work on the poets with the translation of their work so that we could get a, a feel for this plutocratic world. It's a sort of plutocratic Arabia before the sort of Arabia we see now. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I look forward to hoping we can find out more about it through that because it seems like there was competition between the poets and stuff, just yeah. like there was in the ancient Greek world, right? Yes, so indeed. Yes, indeed. Constellation Pegasus is back again. Matter is made of quarks and electrons, basically. Matter does not affect spirits. Did Allah put a magic spell on each star before he let them <laughs> as missiles against the jinn? Uh, shouldn't the Quran use dark matter and energy? Uh, of course, uh, uh, Constellation is obviously a skeptic of sorts. So, um, uh, well, that th this is, yes, uh, well, it's, it's um, my, um, <laughs> I'm, you know, I am, I am silenced even more. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the, what, 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 what the questioner says there is obviously uh, true. Although it's not entirely true. I mean, the, the question, the mind-body, the mind-matter 
uh, 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 problem has not been uh, definitively uh, decided so that spirit might affect matter and matter spirit. I think we, we could allow for that. Um, but clearly, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the phrasing in the Quran is drawing on an older, an older understanding of, of cosmology. Of cosmology and, and yeah, physics. that was love you, mama. Uh, I'll, I'll call you guys when I'm done with the live stream. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, I, I think that that was, the, I think what constellation is ultimately getting at is we are, most people in the modern day are not trying to understand this is a book written for a period of time, for a certain, you know, people who understand things in a period of time. And I guess what Constellation is also trying to do, and I'm reading your brain here, Constellation, is that we're, we deal with fundamentalists in every uh, religion in the world. Christianity, Judaism, you know, Islam, you name it, Hinduism, everywhere. And sometimes they will act like there's an omniscience in the text. So really the cosmology isn't dated. And you don't, in the, in the scholarly world, I find there isn't that engagement. It's typically just academic work that usually mm -hmm. academics are engaging in. So when they come to the world of YouTube and they get questions like this, they're like, I don't, this is foreign to me. I'm not mm -hmm. familiar with this kind of engagement because there are people out there that are trying to argue that, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's not flat earth cosmology or yeah, 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 it's not this, it's not that. And uh, this is why I refer to the academics. So constellations back again it says, was Allah good, the good. first God, the first God <laughs> used <laughs> aircraft fire technology against right. his snooping enemies? Um, I I'm sure not. Zeus, <laughs> Zeus would have done that long before. But look, constellation, I, I should say, I should say this. Um, I've given uh, an excessively sort of clear account of the central the central uh, motifs in the Quran. Now, there are lots of elements that don't tally with it, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and which I think were, you know, phrases, ideas, current in Arabia, which came out in the prophet's utterances. And what, I, what I've been trying to do and what I tried to do when I, when I first read the Quran was try to follow what were the main lines of his thought. Now, Allah using stars to pelt jinn is completely out of line, but it's there. And there are other things that are completely out of line, uh, which uh, may be mini scenarios or phrases uh, that were current in Arabia at the time. Now, uh, there's there's no problem uh, explaining how this got into the mind of the prophet, if the prophet was divinely inspired rather than simply uh, uttering what was dictated to him by God. There's more of a problem of explaining how it got into what was being dictated. Um, right. And, and and I just want you to know, James, that where where i'm at you're you're not talking to someone who needs to explain that but i understand why you're saying it so mm -hmm. so i i we i understand and i want to say one thing um uh, you know what actually scratch that we won't get into any more about my questions and stuff we'll yeah. do more episodes down the road i think and we can cover more topics because uh, i think it's wonderful to see the world around find its way in. Actually, I will ask, I will ask this question. And I think this is relevant to what you just described. There seems to be debate even within amongst Muslims when there's language of God's right hand. Uh, they, they want to die on the hill of anthropomorphic language saying he's not really got a right hand. He, he's, it's, it's, a, it's a phraseology just mm -hmm. saying like he has his power. Um, then other Muslims like, no, like Allah has a hand. It says he has a hand. And I read ancient Near Eastern literature and study with the scholars from the ancient Near East and stuff that like these gods are anthropomorphic. In fact, even Yahweh himself is like the other ancient Near Eastern deities. It's an evolution over time with philosophy that we find that God becomes like incorporeal, what we're describing as the God Allah in this all this fate beyond human mm -hmm. comprehension, if anything. Um 
and I wonder if there's like true two modes of issues going on within the text of the of the Quran with this language. I don't know. I, I figure I'd throw it, see what your thoughts were because there are inconsistencies as you described, and I'm wondering if some of these inconsistencies are coming through in that language. Um, uh, yes, I mean clearly, clearly yes, um, but the uh, that. Like God sits uh, I, on a don't think, I, don't, I don't think that there's any, well, except for the satanic verses, uh, there's no, there's nothing else within the Quran that brings Allah down into a world where an anthropomorphic uh, 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 image of him uh, could be conceived of. Uh, so it, it, I think it takes us back to that. Otherwise, uh, I mean, the the, 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 uh, the the most consistent element is the omnipotence and omnis omniscience mm -hmm. and uh, oneness of God. Um, so uh, all the you know the little the little trills and trills uh, are happening in the intermediate in the intermediate area. And I said it's a void. Well, I think that. In the fundamental thinking, it is, but in fact, it's it's populated by by the shadow, you know, shadows of jinn and angels, and and uh, clearly we've got shooting stars aiming for targets. <laughs> thank you so much. Stop scamming, man. Thank you again, everybody, for the support. Gilams, am I pronouncing that properly? Gilams, Gilams translation of Ibanish. Okay. Um, Gilam's translation of Ibn Ashak's bio of Muhammad yeah. speaks of Muhammad writing and in one place he says he is a Gentile and a footnote says this was misconstrued as illiterate. Is this correct? Have you ever heard of that? Uh, I, well, obviously I've, I've read. Uh, I mean, that that is the, 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 the way that the non-fluent Arabic, uh, uh, Arabic reader uh, engages with the uh, the Sira. Um and I don't I don't remember I don't remember that now that, that there may be um, there may be a fault in the translation, but um, or uh, so uh, I can't I can't I mean I I would need to refer to my cop my copy to see whether that's, right. that's correct or not. But I think if uh, if stops coming man. Uh, 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 has read it and thinks that so. I, I think it is so, and um, something has gone wrong in the text of. Well, it's not Ibn Ishaq's bi uh, biography. It's Ibn Ishaq's biography revi revised revised by Ibn Hisham, um, uh, and something has obviously something has obviously. <laughs> Uh, uh, gone wrong. Uh, the, 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 the thought of Muhammad writing, I'm perfectly ready to accept that. So I'm not ready to accept the misconstruing of Gentile as illiterate. Um, uh, you obviously, you can't both write and be illiterate. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 what is meant by Gentile? What I'd want to know what the Arabic word uh, is. And I, I expect... It's a piece of abuse of Muhammad, and um, it may be, you know, simply saying he's a non-believer in the gods of Mecca, or he's, uh, you know, he's an outsider. He should be ex expelled. But I don't know what the word in Arabic is, so I can't say anything more. That's a great point because when I read a lot of the um, rabbis' works and going through some of the rabbis, various rabbis say different things. But they use goy or goyim, Hebrew, mm -hmm. um, ethne, ethnos in the Greek, um, as a derogatory, a pejorative mm -hmm. towards yeah. those who are not Jews or those who are not really God's people. And so, yeah, you kind of wonder, is this a pejorative um, being struck at the prophet? Uh, as I'm, a, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Um, but obviously the word Gentile would have an entirely different uh, uh, a meaning. I mean, uh, what they're meaning in, uh, I presume this is a, this is in Mecca. Uh, so what they would mean by uh, uh, 
what they would be contrasting. I'm sure they'd be saying basically Muhammad isn't someone who belongs in Mecca. Right. And yeah. something worth looking into and stop scamming man's back. I really appreciate the love, everybody. I've heard that leather was Mecca's main export. Does this suggest Arabia was less arid, more fertile, and able to support cattle at the time? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, the, the late Patricia Croner, uh, early on, she wrote a book on Me Meccan trade in which she tried to, she rubbished. Uh, the whole notion of uh, uh, great um, uh, uh, convoys of, uh, of of camels carrying um, uh, spices and unguents and so on to the north, on which I think she was wrong. Um, but late in life, she came round to saying, yes, there were things that could be exported. There was wool and uh, there was leather. Hmm. Uh, so the answer is yes, uh, not in Emeka's immediate uh, surroundings, but you've got you know the better watered lands on the uh, on the edge of the interior of of Arabia, and there of course you could have cattle, you could have cattle and sheep as as well as uh, uh, obviously as, as well as camels. So yes, um, and uh, there are allusions to it. Not in the Quran, but in early Islamic poetry, to the leather and and the wool, hmm. red leather. Thank you, Stop Scamming Man. Thank you, everybody who has showed us some love today uh, via super chat, uh, liking this video, commenting, and uh, enjoying the chat below. Dr. James Howard Johnson, you've done quite a bit of work, and you continue to do so. We've discovered the secret, and if you don't mind, um, for those who may be tuned in late. Uh, a recap of what we what we've talked about, and maybe um, we can do something in the future, diving deeper into some of these uh, topics. If you're interested, if you're interested. Oh yes, oh yes. No, I like I like these uh, these these uh, long distance communications from uh, southern Britain, Brighton in Sussex to California. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Not the whole notion of it. Um, so a quick recap. Uh, the um, I've presented uh, Islam as a, as a religion which is both familiar in the Middle East with Christian and Jewish uh, and other uh, sort of component parts, but which was a fundamentally new uh, new configuration with with uh, with. Uh, a, a leading idea, which is of the uh, the extreme um, uh, remoteness, austereness of a single, all-powerful, uh, all-knowing God who shapes everything that occurs on the surface of the earth. And that I see as a notion of God, uh, which fitted peculiarly well with the ecology and the experience of life in Arabia. And so my, my, my central thesis is that if Muhammad was able to communicate with the Bedouin tribes and the settled villages of Arabia uh, from Medina, to which he had withdrawn in 622, that the new religion would spread like wildfire. On the other hand, um, the... The new religion, the enthusiasm which it uh, developed in the individual believer, uh, the extraordinary uh, commitment to the faith, which, of course, we still see manifest all over the world uh, now, uh, by itself could not have defeated the massed, well-trained armed forces of uh, the two great empires, which dominated the world around Arabia. Admittedly, those empires had fought a long war, but the one had emerged victorious uh, and it was buoyed up uh, by victory. The other uh, had been worsted, but the main body of its armed forces had not been defeated. So the armies that they could field were large, well-organized, well-trained. And both those armies were defeated in open battle. Um, in the case of uh, 
uh, we have we have three battles, three major battles uh, recorded for the conquest of Palestine and Syria uh, in the West, and three uh, battles, the last being the Battle of uh, Cadicia on, uh, on the 6th of January, 638, on the edge of Iraq. Uh, these battles were won by the Arab Muslims. Now, they were won, in my view, because uh, the, uh, the core of the faithful, of the followers of Muhammad, uh, at a certain stage, at a late stage, uh, after the emigration to Medina in 628, uh, managed to fuse their interests with those of the Meccans, a city-state uh, with developed statecraft, developed organizational cap capability, with the, basically the capability to uh, or organize the logistics to get a sufficiently large body of fighting men to the arenas of, of war. And that, I argue, was achieved by an immense concession made by the Prophet Muhammad uh, in 628, which was to shift Islam's focus from looking to Jerusalem, the holy city of Jews and Christians, and up to that point of Muslims, to shift the focus from Jerusalem to the pagan cult center of Arabia, the Kaaba in Mecca, and to incorporate all the pagan traditions associated with the Kaaba, but minus the idols of the all the pagan gods into the new religion. And that uh, uh, basically enabled these two very different powers, the one sort of spiritual, moral, the other political, economic, uh, to combine into an all-powerful, all-conquering entity. Mm. Poetic, very poetic, James. We have one last super chat, and they ask, I don't own a Quran. Any recommendations for buying an English copy from Constellation Pegasus? Ah. Um, well, Penguin Books. Penguin Books uh, 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 do, uh, do one. They've gone and, uh, before the Satanic Verses, they rearrange the Suras into a rough chronological order but they, put them, they, they immediately put them back into the canonical order. Uh, there's also a, uh, a world uh, Oxford University Press World Classics uh, translation. Uh, that's probably better. Uh, but those, both of those are easily obtainable. Um, but if anything, read it backwards from the air, uh, because you're, you're more likely to get the chronological, chronological order from reading the shortest suras first, which are at the end, uh, and then um, come forwards to Sora 2, which you'll find at the beginning. Thank you so much, James. I really appreciate your time. Uh, you do this so effortlessly. It's it's amazing to learn this material. Um, is there a cliffhanger like our last episode that you could uh, maybe leave us on in terms of a potential future episode that you can think? I've put you on the spot today, haven't I? I've really mm -hmm. <laughs> I squeezed the grape for everything it has. Um you have much more, I'm certain. Is there something we can we can leave people on a hook on for a future show? Well, I think Gog and Magog. I would hang on to Gog and Magog and uh, uh, basically uh, for the, because uh, the real Gog and Magog, I mean, the real Gog uh, to the north is, of course, Russia. And the early history of Russia is one of the most uh, fascinating historical topics. It takes us on a couple of centuries, but there are uh, there are things, there are extraordinary things uh, which can be observed there, and which possibly I've observed. At, at any rate, they loom larger in my mind than in other minds. So, um, how how was it uh, that uh, Russia? Russia emerged and uh, gained control of so huge an area of Eastern, of Eastern Europe, of Western Eurasia in the ninth, 
and uh, uh, basically in the 9th and 10th centuries AD. And that's the base from which all Russian, subsequent Russian history uh, follows. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, go down in the description, go check out Dr. Howard Johnson's books. And I really appreciate you tuning in. Thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to our next episode. Really do appreciate your time, James. My, well, no, no, my pleasure. No, I like it. I enjoy it. Um, uh, so uh, thank you very much for having me on. Thank you, everybody. Look forward to the next one. Um, this has been a blast. Never forget. Never forget. We are MythVision. Have an, a wonderful day, everybody. Mm -hmm.